Welcome to the Michael Brooks Show. I'm Michael Brooks. We're broadcasting from our quarantine zones with super producer Matt Luck. Yo. Chief economist, the man in the shadows, <laughs> David Griscom. How's it going? On this week's program, Dr. Cornell West. We begin the year with President Lula. We march into spring with Dr. West. Regular, regular visits from Adolph Reed. I mean, high quality, folks, high quality. We're talking about spiritual sustenance in this time, the politics of the moment, the prophetic voice, where we go from here in dialogue and quarantine with Professor West on the gem. We're talking about Argentina's creditors. They were letting Argentina off a little bit when there was a right-wing government. Now there's a center-left government. They're back to pure vulturism. And of course, in the post game, we're talking about the heating up of rhetoric against China and how to actually forge a coherent position with regards to the most important rising power in the world, but also remembering that Asia is a continent, not a country as we assess the geostrategic fallout of Cold War politics here, even as we are completely dependent on China for the entirety of our supply chain. We've got a debunk. We're also talking about organizing at Harvard in the post game. Joshua Khan is here for a rebel music history. These Trump ads hit hard, although Biden might have a stronger chance than we realize. And Caribbean continues to resist U.S. imperialism and piracy in the age of Corona. All that and much, much more on The Michael Brooks Show, continuing with our enhanced schedule on Thursday evening. We're talking with Brian Mayer about Corona in Brazil and Latin America. And we're also talking with Steve Cook about the geopolitics of the oil shock, oil prices in I mean, they're not in free fall anymore because yeah. they've hit. They smashed <laughs> through the floor. They have connected. The, the velocity has connected. <laughs> All that and much, much more on this week's Michael Brooks show. But first, let's talk about the global south and corona. I mentioned earlier the appalling stories of the United States using its naval vessels and ships to divert vital resources headed to the Caribbean, including ventilators to Barbados and Jamaica, even as the Venezuelan government under siege from the United States provides testing kits to several of its Caribbean neighbors. Let's go across some of the wider world and how this is playing out. In Mexico, border factories have continued to stay open despite the crisis. In Juarez, US-owned factories that make car seat textiles and worker uh, had workers report to the infirmary with coughs and fevers. They were given pain relief and told to get painkillers and told to go back to work. Mexico who was not properly prepared after decades of austerity and significant cuts to the hospital system. Now there's conflicting reports on how AMLO is responding. No question that AMLO is attempting to restore and build an actual safety net in Mexico, and that the, again, the same US and reactionary forces are circling. Um, AMLO, however, has refused, of course, to shut down the country, and we will see how those consequences play out. In Brazil, J.R. Bolsonaro, Donald Trump really should thank him, because there's always the one person in the world doing a worse, more buffoonish, ridiculous, grotesque job than Trump. He's been fighting with governors. He fired his own health minister. And just yesterday, he appeared hacking and extremely unhealthy looking at a protest against the quarantine. I'm sure all of us will swear to give our lives for our country one day, and we will do everything possible to exchange to change Brazil's destiny, he said. Meanwhile, President Lula in quarantine who of course led by double digits in 2018, would be the president today without the US-backed Lava Jato operation in the continent of Africa. We've seen a variety of responses. And the 
Paul Kagame, the president of Rwanda, said it could take a decade to recover if there's not an international response to COVID-19. The World Bank predicts a continent-wide depression in Africa. In South Africa, President Cyril Ramaphosa has won international uh, credit and plaudits for international uh, praise, rather, for shutting down the country and enforcing a strict quarantine. However, police brutality reports have been rampant. And just like in the United States and elsewhere, uh, there has not been a serious plan to protect workers and the poor during the shutdown. In India, uh, the state of Kerala has won international praise. We've talked about it on this show. The communist run state of Kerala has along with South Korea, Taiwan, and others, uh, actually been credited with incredible responses to the pandemic. They've instituted social distancing. They've mobilized community networks uh, to help with monitoring the virus, but also delivering food and other, other vital necessities to people in vulnerable communities and throughout. Kerala stands out. Modi, like Orban and other authority, authoritarians, is using this crisis to try to consolidate his power after inciting pogroms against the Muslim population and stripping the Indian constitution to occupy Kashmir. The government has, of course, targeted Muslims. The health minister uh, has regularly blamed the is Islamic seminaries for spreading the virus, and the BJP officials, the party of Prime Minister Modi have used phrases like Corona Jihad. Coronavirus is bringing down, is adding to an already deeply divided, deeply unequal world. It's wrecking health systems. It's adding to debt burdens and further jeopardizing economies dependent on the Western system. Remittance, which are a major factor in poorer countries, are down as the economy went into lockdown in the global north. International organizations are going to need to step up and provide enormous debt relief, global bailouts, and this also must be another opportunity for a serious rethink about how the global economy works and can we at last have a world that centers workers and not predatory transnational capital. The consequences will live with us for decades if we don't act now and demand international debt jubilees and support the extraordinary bravery of governments and activists in the global South, whether they be at a regional or national levels that are resisting and providing dynamic alternatives and paths forward. Do you guys have anything you want to add to that? Uh, just briefly, I, I just wanted to highlight that example about uh, Juarez. Um, you know, that's one of the yeah. things that's so frightening about the, the coronavirus is it really is laying bare the inequities, obviously in the United States, but across the whole entire global supply chain. Um, so, you know, those are workers working in an American-owned corporation, a corporation that basically is profiting off of the hyper-exploitation of those people. And they kept that factory open and allowed people to work, even though they clearly had symptoms um, for a very long time. And now the COVID has actually spread from that factory across the entire city of Warren. That was where it, it, it began in the area. And that, that's not an isolated story. Um, we're seeing across the globe um, this kind of like squeeze for profit is putting people who are very marginalized in the first place in the, in the way of this barreling train of, of coronavirus. Uh, so, you know, when we're talking about relief, uh, we desperately need to be, you know, focusing on those stories as well and recognizing that all of these struggles are very much connected uh, to this fundamental political and economic inequity of, of global capitalism. Totally. Yeah. And they synchronize with what we see here, obviously. I mean, I keep talking about the interview with Chris Smalls. And next week, we're going to be talking with a couple of organizers, including a Teamsters organizer in Philadelphia. I think it's very, very important to take this opportunity to really think and really even just familiar, familiarize ourselves very specifically with the state of organized labor in this country and elsewhere. What is union den density in this country? It's very small, obviously, and it's obviously much more represented in the public sector versus the private sector. Um, we need to understand exactly where we are and exactly where there are opportunities with regards to 
labor mobilization because ultimately there's no prospects for a left without mass organized labor. Mm -hmm. And I also do think because of the unique obscenity and pressure uh, of this moment, and we're going to also talk more about those reopen protests in the post game and, you know, the smart way of handling it, which disaggregates the AstroTurf element of people like the DeVos family and obviously the Nazi and neo-fascist elements, but also the reality that there's plenty of people that need, of course they feel a need to go back to work because there has been no proper bailout and protection for normal people. And this is the context we're in. If you don't speak directly to that politically and with an actual plan, uh, then it will just get recycled into more basically death and waste. Yeah. And, you know, and we're very much exposed to um, not only to, you know, these kind of crises be, you know, be they through disease, but natural disasters have operated in the same way, especially in the United States, um, in how they're affecting different communities. And it's not, it's not an accident, basically, that it's like the, the poor and the working class communities that are bearing the brunt um, of, of this kind of global collapse that we're seeing both in the environment and in our, our global health. So, yeah, and, you know, just speaking to the U.S., it's true that our density is low, and which, is, which means we're in a weak position. Um, but it also means that we have a lot of potential uh, to grow out, too. So we should think about it in that way as well, that we aren't as like, constrained when it comes to building out labor organizations um, as people in other countries are. Right. And like there is those opportunities. Off instead of having to fight only with like a union bureaucracy like you have to in a lot of other countries. Right. Right. And it's also a really, you know, uh, another really interesting question and thing to look at arising out of the 1990s with the complete myth where there was the rhetoric of international law, the rhetoric of international institutions, which really have very little power. I mean, obviously, there's countless examples of this, but, you know, the Bush administration very consciously spitting in the face of the United Nations before the invasion of Iraq, as an example. And the fascinating and really disturbing thing is, is that in contrast to all these other kind of global efforts that which fell short on the environment, on labor standards, and even on, you know, to some extent, uh, you know, full funding for global health responses and pandemic aware uh, preparedness and so on, the international trade architecture has actually been really vigorously enforced. Mm. And it has been an international mechanism that has really re remapped the world and has had incredibly, you know, huge consequences, like the factories and wars, which would not be there in the way they are without NAFTA, as an example. And so this is actually a really great example of how the sort of relationship between global trade and the institutions built up around that, that the corollaries you need with, as an example, global health infrastructure, uh, have never been caught up and they have not run in parallel. Um, and so that's another thing, obviously, to bear in mind. And, and, you know, and ultimately, again, I think we'll talk with Chuka Ajekman about this hopefully soon, but what is a grounded, real way of talking about how these labor movements can actually link up internationally? Does the International Labor Organization, which already exists, does that have mechanisms that can be reoccupied? Are, you know, how is communication infrastructure used? What, what does that actually look like concretely? It's really important, but it can't just be slotted as like, you know, again, another sort of utopian project. It needs to be something that we actually really think about. And to the extent people like us have any role, attempt to facilitate if we can. Yeah. And, and just like recognizing too that like um, I'm going to talk about this in the gym, but like are the opposing force has a very good consciousness of themselves. Like there's a reason, for example, that workers in the United States are so fragmented from right. their uh, suppliers in Mexico um, so that they can't build that kind of solidarity. And, you know, so we have to do a lot of work on our end to actually be able to build that in, in the first place while our opponents recognize that they need to keep people as far away from each other as possible. Um, to be able to maintain their, their supremacy. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah. And, that, and that's actually, we, I'll, another thing I'll tease in the post game is we have this great Alexander Coburn clip mm. where he talks at the height of the tea party nonsense and, you know, the height of the sort of epic bullshit phase of Glenn Beck, 
but he already has a very di- a very strong critique of what should the left actually be doing with regards to that. Mm-hmm. And you know, he's and he has this great line about basically like people becoming dupes and essentially becoming like foot soldiers of HMOs um, through some kind of, you know, through the kind of garbage that's peddled to them through the Glenn Becks of the world. And again, it's just the same dynamic. Condemnation is not going to get us anywhere. Um, yeah. And at the very least, when you come with a compelling alternative, then you can disaggregate between, you know, the people who are looking for something versus the people who are like, no, no, man, it, it's the constitution or whatever the fuck. Uh, I want to do a little Patreon pitch. I'll also say, if you're watching this and you haven't yet, welcome to the show. Hit subscribe, hit the bell, so you get the notifications for our live streams. If you want, we won't. We don't get to any. We only do questions um, during uh, during uh, other live streams. Uh, but if you want to, obviously, feel free to hit the super chat and uh, welcome aboard. Uh, but uh, Griscom and Matt, you guys are going to have the Patreon pitch. Uh, pleasantries of today um because i'm going to sit here and, and meditate and get ready to talk to professor west <laughs> <laughs> well i mean i guess i'll begin i'm going to cue up the music just slightly so please some accompaniment um i mean we're really flexing lately i think we had slavo on uh live from his couch um and it was great one of the uh, just amazing conversation uh adolf reed becoming a crew member um this crew. Year. adolf <laughs> um, reed is crew basically and uh yeah cornell west i mean we were we kind of talked i don't know if it was on mic or not but i mean michael's bucket list is getting really crossed off yeah um, it's true <laughs> and uh and it's all because of the people who were the first you know first couple thousand people who helped us fund this and exactly. I mean, imagine where we're going to go in another couple of years. So, I mean, it was just, what did the old email say? Like 2017 was when this thing launched? 2017. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not that long, but here we so are. So long ago and so close. Seriously. Yeah, and I'm, you know, to, I, thanks for putting it that way too, man. I'm really honored by the community uh, and appreciate it so much. David. Well, you know, Matt sort of uh, laid down the vision. I'll put down some specifics. Uh, you know, you really, honestly, um, not to throw a share at anyone else who's doing this kind of show, but I don't think anyone else is really putting out as much content as we do each week. Uh, you're getting the full post game, which these post games, as we've been in quarantine, have been going on significantly longer, right? We're really, we're really, really giving you, you know, two to one for your money. Uh, a lot of the field. Hold up here. Um, you know, we have that right after, after this show, um, but we're also doing bonus interviews uh, with, you know, really fascinating, uh, fascinating guests. You know, this deep dive that we just did with Adolf Reed was another thing that was incredible uh, too. Is there another podcast out there that has something like Adolf Reed regularly as a guest uh, making content for them? No, I mean, we're really, you know, we're really feeding you um, for your for your subscription. We also do theory reading groups. Uh, every yeah. Monday I put together a few pieces. Uh, this week uh, we took a dive into Cuba and what its significance is, so what some of the issues are with it. And, uh, you know, but other than that, you know, we'll do sometimes pieces, you know, reading France Fanon, uh, reading some of the early um, Soviet literature before like the revolution. I mean, we're really giving you a comprehensive look at all the different theories and ideas on the left. And, you know, again, as Matt said, you're really helping support something that is continuing to grow. And we're looking at a few uh, different options, places that we're going to move out to in the near future. Um, and you're really supporting a you know a, a growing group of people um, that are out there really trying to make the world a little bit of a better place. Yeah, and helping us grow and evolve uh, while we do it. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's an amazing process, and it's a it's a great honor. And um, you know, if you can go to Patreon.com/tmbs, we're obviously helping folks out. And also, if you're in a position, um, you know, where you don't need. Uh, that help and you want to join at a higher level, go for it. I want to be really clear. Those at an $8 level get every single show we do. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the shows we're doing now are public. But in addition to that, you know, if you go to $21 level, I do those, you know, uh, do kind of monthly conference calls with folks. And also you get the illicit history docs first, which we do unlock because again, we want as much content out there for people. But those docs are amazing that mm-hmm. Forrest and Vic Bayana work on with me and uh, the next one, which will be being released soon, is on Thomas Sankara featuring the great Milton Alamadi. 
Mm -hmm. Um, Folks, what did you say? Quick break. We're going to take a quick break and we will be right back with Dr. Cornell West. Welcome back to the Michael Brooks Show. I am Michael Brooks. Joining us now is Dr. Cornell West. He is a professor of the practice of public philosophy at Harvard University. He's the author of many, many books, including Race Matters, Democracy Matters, and as people have been pointing out to me a lot today, you've also have probably seen him in The Matrix, in addition to all of his enormous contributions to activism and moral consciousness in this country and across the globe. Dr. West, thank you so much for doing this. Brother, I'm the one who's blessed and I want to salute you, not just for the work you do here on the radio, but your recent text against the web, dealing with some of these right-wing intellectuals, trying to keep them accountable. And you do a marvelous job. And it's just a blessing to be in conversation with you, though, brother. Indeed, indeed. We met uh, at Harvard a couple of months ago, and oh yeah, (laughs) we're actually going to have on uh, Piper later to talk about some of the work that the Harvard students are doing to try to uh, protect the workers there during this time. And I just wanted to start with the sort of timeline of what some of us thought, maybe naively, a couple of months ago was a real opportunity for an enormous change at that time represented in the Bernie Sanders momentum. And here we are, I remember uh, flying back from LA at an event I was doing the night of Super Tuesday when when Bernie, you know, it it didn't go so well. And, and you and then I realized that Corona was a was a real thing. And I remember sitting on the plane going, wow, Bernie's out and we've got a pandemic. Okay. (laughs) Can you talk about that shift? and where we are now and how to fortify ourselves in that context. Well, I have very precious memories of that dialogue we had there with Brother Phil Agnew and Sister Crystal and Piper. All the students were marvelous. 
they were magnificent there. Uh, that's the sister who took off with that first speech. Wasn't she something? Something else. Oh, Incredible. My God, she was powerful. Her mother was there too. But no, Piper. I think we want a first. Situ- it's, oh, oh, that is Sister Piper. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I think I knew about her first name. Yeah. But uh, uh, but I must say that uh, I think it's important to situate ourselves before we even jump into uh, that particular moment, because the crucial thing is, is that, you know, the Bernie Sanders campaign comes along as an attempt to engage in some kind of revitalized, regenerating of progressive possibilities in the midst of an American empire in profound decay and deterioration. And so when you've got the, the, the greed at the top of a predatory capitalist civilization, and then you've got the denial of its imperial tentacles, then you've got the vicious legacies of white supremacy that sit at the very center of the American imperial project, vis-a-vis indigenous peoples, black peoples, brown, but especially, of course, the weight of slavery, uh, and, and yellow too. And then you've got the vicious kinds of patriarchy at work. And what happens in the last, oh, 12 months is one of the last gaps, one of the last efforts to try to accent the best of the progressive legacy of a decaying empire. Hmm. And there are those moments where it looked as if, lo and behold, the milquetoast neoliberals tied to Wall Street, tried, tied to the military industrial complex with their own forms of captivity, the white male supremacy, it looked as if they were in a situation where they could not stop the Bernie campaign. And there was moments of elation. You know, we, we were fired up, though, brother. Mm-hmm. And we moved to Nevada. Oh, even the corporate media had to say, oh, now we must take Bernie seriously. They had been treating him so so viciously in such an ugly way. And this is true for MSNBC especially, but uh, voices on CNN as well. Of course, Fox News, you just take for granted the uh, the mean-spiritedness and the unfairness vis-a-vis Brother Bernie, calling him a communist and a Bolshevik and so forth and so on. But that was a moment in which especially young brothers and sisters, because as you know, if the, the only folk who could vote in America were under 40, Bernie would have been in the White House five five years ago. Uh, uh, and he would win again. Yes. But my generation comes in with all of our cowardliness and all of our myopia and short-sightedness and, and selfishness and what have you uh, uh, that serves as a kind of uh, incubus around, I mean, just like a, a weight around the neck of the empire that doesn't allow the best of the empire to come forward. And so where are we now? We're now we're in one of the most grim and dim and bleak moments in the history of the empire, in the history of the nation, the history of the country. And the democratic experiment that's always been trying to come to fuller birth against the backdrop of the imperial corruption, the backdrop of the capitalist greed, the backdrop of the vicious white supremacy, the ugly male supremacy, and so forth, uh, uh, it's very hard now to discern real possibilities, real uh, uh, potentialities that can be actualized at this moment. So we just got to fight. We just fight against against the grain. You know, it, it's going to be blues like all the way down. You know what I mean? What is Been the down relationship? So long, down don't worry me no more. Therefore, I got to keep on fight because it just looks bleak. It really is. It does look bleak and it feels bleak. Absolutely. But it, and it is bleak. It is it bleak. Is. What is the relationship between it? I guess I want to ask you, is there a liberation in that realism though? Because I've been trying to push the idea and maybe this is me just doing some spin. I don't know, but that if mm-hmm. you can be really honest about where we are, and that includes that, that you have this grotesque president and everything that he represents. It also includes that you have a democratic party that consolidates more effectively to stop Bernie Sanders, basic decency agenda than 
anything else they've consolidated around in decades. And that, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that this is that, and all of the accelerating crises we're in that, that this is really, really bleak. And we, we, we don't have to sanitize it. We don't have to say, Oh, well, I don't know, maybe Biden will turn out to be great. Or maybe, you know, maybe some, this or that will happen that if we sit in that real discomfort and we really are real, that in a way that opens up some space for us to see a bigger horizon. And maybe on the other hand, there are these countervailing forces. There are Amazon workers going on strike. There are a whole new sets of people tragically getting exposed to conditions that they haven't been exposed to before. And maybe that awakens something else. You know, the the favorite word of the great Samuel Beckett, the great poet and playwright, was perhaps. <laughs> and I like that. I like yeah. that. Because perhaps what you're saying is indeed true. Yeah, so that I would never want to put any kind of negative closure and say that it's all bleak and it's all grim. That sometimes a certain kind of realism has been said that romanticism is a, a really... Uh, a realism, a realism of the romanticism on all fours. Mm. So that you got your feet on the ground, all of them on the ground. The animals got all theirs on the ground, connected to the suffering, connected to the misery, connected to the despair, connected to the despondency. And yet you can still feel the rumblings with those feet on the ground of some folks trying to break through. The calls for general strike, May 1, the calls for the various kinds of, uh, of resistances across the board. Uh, some of them are, are socialists, some of them are liberals, some of them are communists. Some are, there's a whole vast array of people who are fighting the fascism of the Trump administration. And, and we need that kind of anti-fascist coalition. This is what makes it difficult. You have a coalition with folks, you have deep disagreements, but one thing you agree on, you must push back not just Trump in the White House, but the forces behind him. Because if it were just a matter of a, uh, of, of a gangster in the White House, you'd just be able to push the gangster out, and lo and behold, we got some Democratic uh, uh, awakenings taking place. No, it's not that at all. There's a lot of forces behind Trump. Some of the forces behind Trump uh, are outright right-wing some of the forces do have certain neoliberal connections. We know there there were certain neoliberals in the Democratic Party who preferred Trump over my dear brother Bernie Sanders. And that's precisely the reason that we had to be very honest and candid about the truth telling. What does it mean to have a neo-fascist right wing tied to Wall Street, tied to the military industrial complex with its captivity, the white male supremacy and so forth, and then have a neoliberal wing of that same ruling class? Mm. It, which is the Democratic establishment, right? Or the establishment in the Democratic Party, you see. And they still have very deep connections, even though they are different. And I, I would never say that they are equivalent. You know, people oftentimes like to characterize left wing folk, uh, like myself and others, saying, "Where do you stand? There's no difference." Nobody said there's a there's a difference between a neo fascist catastrophe and a neo liberal disaster. <laughs> there is a difference. There's a big difference. Hey, and, and, the and, Medellin and, cartel and, 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 and the Cali cartel operated very differently. They're both still They cartels. operate very differently. And, and, and when it comes to you know certain kind of concerns, the rights and liberties, when it comes to certain kind of concessions to, uh, to working people and poor people, those concessions are important. And that's what our neoliberals like to harp on. But those same ne- neoliberals are willing to unfairly oftentimes uh, of marginalized and outright trash or lie on even a soft leftist like Bernie Sanders. Because we know Bernie Sanders was not running on the Democratic Socialist platform at all. He was running on a, a, a progressive neo populist platform. He was running on an FDR like robust progressive liberal, old style liberal platform. And he still was pushed to the side in the name of a neoliberal unity. And you saw them all come together with Biden, the Clintons, Sister Amy and Brother Pete. And of course, Obama is the political pope in the background who speaks supposedly is untouchable for those in the Democratic Party. But those of us who want to tell the truth know that he remains the godfather 
of contemporary uh, neoliberalism in the American empire. But, uh, uh, but, but to have a black person as that godfather makes it almost impossible for neoliberals to talk honestly about the connection between white supremacy and predatory capitalism. That's why I'm so glad you, you have my dear brother Adolf Reed mm. on. He, he, he is the greatest uh, 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 political theorist that we have who understands the relation between race, predatory capitalism, and empire. And he writes about it. And of course, he's had to cut so radically against the grain because it is a powerful indictment of the black political class, the black professional class, and the worst of the black bourgeoisie. And that black bourgeoisie is now leading not just black people, not just America, but the empire mm-hmm. are helping lead it off a cliff. Because even when we push, push, uh, push Trump out, and we must push Trump out, I do believe in an anti-fascist coalition, but I don't believe in in any way holding my tongue when it comes to the neoliberal c- captivity to capital, the captivity to empire, and the captivity to white supremacist forms that supposedly are anti-racist, but it becomes just diversity within the class hierarchy, diversity within the imperial hierarchy. We've got to be able to tell those truths in the name of W.B. Du Bois and Victoria Garvin and Ella Baker and Fannie Lou Hamer and the later Martin Luther King Jr. We ain't got the Malcolm X yet. <laughs> I want to get to those voices actually in a minute. They didn't die for nothing, my brother. They didn't die for nothing. I want no to get to way. those. I want to get to those. But before we get to those ancestors and, and better things, I want to talk a little bit more about Trump. And I want to ask you specifically, when you use the word fascist and when you also talk about him being a gangster, can you explain, because those words are very, kind of like neoliberal, actually. These words are very thrown around. And I know that if I hear and read you correctly, that you actually have a, a, when you talk about gangsterism, that's a spiritual state that could affect all of us. We all got to wrestle with that. And then when you say he's a fascist, could you explain what that means in terms of the specific historical moment we're in and how it all rep- how it does all intersect in Trump right now in 2020. Yeah, I appreciate that. Well, one is, you know, the difference between a gangster and a hypocrite. A hypocrite still has certain standards and recognizes he or she falls radically short. You see, so that vice becomes a tribute to virtue by acknowledging we know there's vice, we know there's virtue, we're opting for vice. A gangster has no standards at all. A gangster will do anything. It's just survival of the slickest, usually tied to money, status, and tied deeply to insecurity, anxiety, and oftentimes even a sense of inferiority, which takes the form of inflated claims about superiority. So that all of us have gangsters inside of us, you see. So that when I call uh, Trump a gangster, you know, I'm not just just engaging in name calling. You see, uh, Foucault has this wonderful introduction to uh, one of Deleuze's books where he talks about the spiritual fascist inside of all of us. Mm. And that's just another way. I'm a revolutionary Christian, so I got different language, right? Mm-hmm. That's just the devil inside of us. That's just our proclivities toward egoism, selfishness, contempt, hatred, and so forth. Now, fascism is a much more complicated, dangerous phenomenon because it is an ideology that puts a primacy on the rule of big money so elites can be attracted to it. It's a rule of militarism in a military industrial complex. So there's narrow forms of patriotism allow a militarization of a society to take place. And the militarization often has to do with scapegoating the most vulnerable. So it could be Mexicans. It can be Muslims. We know in, in the Hitler, it was oppressed Jewish brothers and, stuff, and sisters, you see. And, but it's also tied to this sense of 
catastrophe. We are the only ones who can come to your rescue. Mm -hmm. Your society is collapsing and the big military, big money, narrow patriots, scapegoating the most vulnerable become the only option of some kind of escape or some kind of salvation. And fascism comes in a number of different forms. American fascism is going to be different than Italian, different than Portuguese, going to be different than Brazilian, it's going to be different than, 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 than French and so forth. And American fascism will come, usually comes in the form of we can be successful, we can be number one, because America's always been an adolescent civilization. The great F.O. Matheson, who taught here at Harvard for over 35 years, used to say America's unique among nations to move from innocence to corruption without a mediating stage of maturity. And what he meant by that was America understands itself as a city on the hill, as an innocent people, don't have to take responsibility for what it does indigenous people. Don't have to take responsibility for what it does to enslaved African folk. It doesn't have to take responsibility for the working people. It's all about liberty, the city on the hill, the moral example in the eyes of the whole world. We are innocent. And we got our frontier myth that says that we innocent, civilized people must expand vis-a-vis the savages. Look at 1877. Withdraw the troops. Black folk under clan-like military rule. And you got the railroad strike. Workers are being crushed by capital. And you got the Sioux War. Indigenous peoples are being pushed back and treated like they're cockroaches. 1877, that particular historical moment where you can see how the innocence tied to the frontier myth allowed for a moral regeneration of a nation through violence. And that's what the myth is about. Richard Slotkin lays this out in his trilogy. Moral regeneration through violence, that's also a form of American fascism. And that's where, when we're seeing that more and more, especially now with this, uh, this coronavirus situation, oh, brother, people on lockdown where the, the forms of violence that goes first inward in terms of psychic violence or the domestic violence within the home and, and the increasing gangsterization of the society in terms of the willingness. We got folk now out marching with automatic weapons, right? Right. I mean, this is, this is, this is a, uh, well, you know, we're, we're at a precipice in terms of uh, what happens when an empire begins to implode, when it begins to, the forms of internal decay become undeniable. I mean, we saw in Katrina to a certain degree, there's certain moments where you just have to see it for what it is. But most Americans are taught in schools, media, to live in a world of denial. That's where innocence is. James Baldwin says about America, innocence itself is the crime. The refusal to see, the refusal to come to terms, to wrestle with history, reality, mortality, not just the individual mortality of our lives, but the mortality of an empire, the mortality of a civilization. So because we're empires all like, come and go. We're all they kind come of and go. like empires come and go. And we're like oh, Trump's, yeah. Trump's doctor in a way. Like, I, I think like, uh, I don't know if you remember this, but when you're talking, I, I, I think of how in, when Trump was running for president, he had some, let's just say, eccentric doctor put out a report saying that, oh, you know, Donald Trump, he's in fantastic health. You know, don't don't worry oh, about I what do you remember see. That. Right. Yeah. Don't worry about yeah. what you yeah. see in front of your face or how he eats or how he's always having an emotional meltdown. This guy is in global world class health. And as you're talking, I'm almost is. OK, so that's so there's the echo throughout history if we want to understand fascism in American context, the connection between innocence, adolescence, and domestic and international imperialism. And then Trump is, I mean, yeah, he's the sales guy. There's no problem here. We can all go back to sleep. The stock market's going great. The virus is going to be over. It's going to be unbelievable. It's going to be great. Is that the kind of psychological retreat you're talking about that correlates with the violence that we see in, in the state policy? I, I think that that's a fascinating and uh, in some ways a uh, compelling interpretation, brother. I mean, one way of looking at it is looking at our present moment through the lens of the greatest American play written by the one and only Eugene O'Neill in The Iceman Cometh. 
we just had our dear brother uh, Denzel Washington uh, playing Hickey, who is the, the major figure in that play uh, on Broadway just a few years ago. It, it's the, the most grim and bleak of all American plays, uh, going all the way back to Timon of Athens or King Lear of the one and only Shakespeare himself. And what does he say? He says, well, Hickey is a seller of dreams. It's very different than the death of a salesman who has a dream, but he's selling something else. Hickey sells dreams, just like Trump. And Hickey appears to be so naive and happy all the time. But in fact, he's a gangster. And we turn out, it turns out in a later play that he has killed his, his wife. Mm. And, 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 and I think the real analogy there would be the ways in which Trump is killing American democracy. Wasn't a whole lot left, but he's killing American democracy. And he doesn't mind. And he doesn't mind because he'll do anything for his own personal gain. He'll do anything for his ratings. He'll do anything for his status. It's narcissists on steroids. So any, when he looks at anything, he sees like narcissists just a mirror and himself in the mirror. And he's all he's preoccupied with himself. Now, the sad thing is, my brother, is not just him, but it's the forces behind him, and it's the opposition. Because you see, the corporate media, which is very much, much more of a neoliberal uh, 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 set of institutions, with the exception, of course, of Fox, which is a propaganda machine for for Trump. And let's keep in mind, you see, MSNBC, and to some degree, CNN was propaganda machine for Obama. Mm-hmm. And it was, you know, it was more humane and so forth because the neoliberal disaster is more humane than the neo-fascist catastrophe. But they're still both inhuman in a lot of other ways. But the corporate media has played so thoroughly into the Trump uh, 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 selling of dreams, the hickey-like, that it makes it difficult to conceive of opposition. So when the Iceman cometh. You know, Eugene O'Neill can't conceive. He was an anarchist. He was a serious leftist. But he can't conceive of any credible leftist project or politics. He says the nation itself has become so saturated with the lies, saturated with what they call these days misinformation, saturated saturated with the lack of truth-telling, that there's nobody there in it. Harry Hope's saloon, and keep in mind the name of the saloon is Hope. You see how Hope gets colonized, Hope gets commodified, Hope gets captured by the lies. So the people are looking for some concrete, grand, genuine hope, but they get peddled this superficial hope, a semblance of hope, a simulacra of hope. Mm. And, 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 and that's where we are now. And see, what Bernie was doing was providing some kind of way out. And the, the way out, my brother, is not just a matter of a campaign, but it's a matter of getting people to see, to see, to, to get out of fantasy, use their imaginations. And most importantly, this is the thing I really want to stress, because this is always a benchmark of the decline and, and, and decay of civilization, is a lack of courage. Mm. The lack of courage. You see that uh, 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 you can't you can't learn to see unless you have the courage to look at things differently. And courage means you have to take risk. Courage means you have to cut against the grain. Courage means you have to call into question what is conventional, what the mainstream is doing. And, and, and part of the U.S. culture is that it hasn't provided enough spaces for people who want to get some kind of serious critique and resistance to the very mainstream conceptions of status and success and money and celebrity uh, uh, stature and so forth and so on, you see. Uh, Herbert Marcuse called it a one-dimensional society, Hmm. that the forms of resistance are so weak, and when they get stronger, they get incorporated within the mainstream that end up reproducing the very hierarchy and structure it was opposing. And we're in that particular moment, and that's why it's blues-like, because, I mean, you, you, the, the blues, of course, is, uh, is, is tied to a kind of uh, defeatless hope, that the hope can never be crushed, but you know you're going to get 
push back and probably lose anyway, but you keep coming. That's a different <laughs> kind of thing. That's even different than Sisyphus. No, but you got to go with a Ma Rainey, a B.B. King to understand that, you know. I will say it reminded me of a very different kind of hope. And I was thinking of this with Bill Clinton being from Hope and Barack Obama. But uh, uh, Fernando Flores, who's a uh, Chilean uh, writer, he said, hope is the raw material of losers. <laughs> I was like, okay. Ooh, <laughs> wow. The raw material of losers. <laughs> Boy, that goes back to Thucydides in the Million Dialogue, where he talks about hope actually can disarm you and leave you naked so that you're headed toward self-destruction. Mm. And, and, and it, that's true. That's true. But it's, but hope is always contextual and the hope is always right. contextual, which is to say that, uh, 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 there are certain kinds of hope that are naive, that are adolescent and what have you, you see defeatless hope. I mean, that's the kind of hope that, uh, the Palestinian brothers and sisters have. Yeah that uh, they've been struggling for so long. It looks as if they can't find any option. They see, it looks as if nobody wants to see their humanity, see their suffering. It's always through the lens of those who occupy them rather than through the lens of their humanity. So that, yes, they have a despair, but it's not King Lear-like despair at the end where they just howl. It's a despair that leads toward being defeatless in your energy, in your resistance, even though it looks as if you have little chance of triumph uh, at the moment. And uh, uh, that's the kind of spiritual, that's why it's very much a spiritual crisis, man. That's the kind of spiritual uh, uh, dimension we have to stress. And fear is the very thing that allows folk to, uh, uh, well, fear overtakes folk and pushes them in a the direction of selling out. This is why this is the age of the sellout. You got you got so many progressives and liberals acting like somehow neoliberals or some highly progressive folks and just telling lies about it, right? But that's just a form of intellectual sellout. Tell the people the truth. Or people give up and say, I'm just going private. I'm not concerned about public life anymore. I'm not concerned about common good anymore. I'm just living my own individual private life. Well, you just give it up. It's, or you just cave in and you just, you know, go to the crack house or, uh, or some form of self-medication that has nothing to do with transformation of self and society. And it's understandable, but it's cowardly in the end. And this is why I come back to the issue of courage, though, man. That's why when we talk about, you know, the Norman Thomases and, and Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel and Edward Zaids and, uh, and Dorothy Days, you know, her daughter is going to be... Uh, up for, uh, up for a conviction uh, uh, in May, uh, going to jail for two years. Uh, Sister Martha standing up in that great tradition. It takes courage. Hmm. Unbelievable, unbelievable courage. And, and it's just hard to uh, keep track of them, though, man. I think of, and I'll send right. you this clip if you haven't seen it, but uh, I, I think of when you talked about that undaunted. We play this a lot on the show, but. Mm. Yeah, uh, mm. President Lula, before he t he brought himself to prison in 2018 on those politically trumped up charges, he he said first he said I could leave the country, but I'm not going to. I'm going to go to their face, and then he said, and you know, he ended with the quote of how the the rich can and the powerful can kill one, two, three, a hundred roses, but they can't stop the coming of spring. And our politics is the fight for the search for spring. Wow. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's very, very, very powerful. But as you know, though, even Brother Lula himself, though, as, uh, as heroic as he's been, I, I go with him all the way back to the Workers' Party when they translated the race matters in 1993. I went down there uh, uh, to work closely with them. I have great respect for Brother Lula and the Workers' Party and so forth. But once you get in power, brother, you still have the challenge of greed and corruption among your cronies. And you have to tell the truth to them because you are working on behalf of the people. We're not talking about purity. We're not talking about people being pristine, you see. But even Brother Lula himself, given all of his heroic work and his historically unprecedented 
breakthroughs and so forth, that the challenge of fighting off corruption and greed is a perennial one. That's why it's, it's a spiritual question and a moral question as well as a political and an ideological. And I know I don't want to get into an analysis of Brazil and the gangster who runs Brazil now. He's neo fascist too. Mm. Uh, he's like the, the neo fascist who runs uh, India right now or Hungary right now. We can go on and on and on. You know what I mean? I mean yeah, we're in amazing. a moment. Mm-hmm. We're in a moment. I was just talking to the newspaper in Norway yesterday, the great land of Ips. Uh, uh, and 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 Camille, uh, Camilla Colette, one of the great uh, leftists and feminists there, uh, and Henrik uh, Vardalen and so forth, all that rich left wing tradition in Norway. Now they got a right wing head, yeah, a uh, woman. So I mean, you, it's 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 a neo fascist right wing moment, uh, uh, and it reminds us of uh, you know it can't happen here, the Sinclair Lewis novel about American fascism or the great Philip Roth plot against America when fascists take over. Uh, one of Zaid's favorite books. Zaid was quite a fan of the Jewish uh, Philip Roth. Can you connect uh, but, that conversation on courage and where we are with, you You say a lot that you're a revolutionary Christian. What does that mean? Mm-hmm. That means that I'm in the world, but not of the world. I recognize that the dominant ways of the world are domination, exploitation, and oppression. And inside of the souls of men and women, the dominant orientations tend to be those of cowardliness, those of conformity, those of complacency, and at worst, indifference or callousness toward the suffering of others. Mm -hmm. So the question becomes, how do you engage in change and transformation of world and of self? And the Christian story, of course, is is a story around a particular Palestinian Jew who tried to convince persons that they ought to be committed to something that is profoundly absurd in the world of domination and hatred, which was love. Mm. That the self ought to be committed to something that is absurd when you look deep in the dark corners of your own soul and you see complacency, cowardliness, and uh, 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 conformity. And he says, be not conformed to the world. Be committed to justice. He comes right out of prophetic Judaism, which is anger. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. He's not talking about philanthropy, not talking about charity. He's talking about justice, a structural and institutional arrangement of a society. And Amos was not just talking to Israel. He was talking to all nations. So it was an indictment of Israel as an indictment of every nation. And I also come from the chocolate side of town, my brother. So my revolutionary Christianity comes out of the struggles of a black peoples who have been hated chronically, viciously for 400 years, but keep, but keep dishing out love warriors like John Coltrane and Curtis Mayfield and Lisa Franklin and Martin Luther King Jr. So that I have to be true to what has been put into me and recognize that no matter how dim my moment is, I am still one who must be true to a calling that says you bear witness to truth-telling and justice-seeking. Truth, the condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak, justice, love, manifest in public. You wrote and a... therefore you... No, oh, sorry, you, 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 you No, just say it, but the important thing is being, being faithful unto death. You see, if people recognize you're going to be faithful unto death, they, they, they can buy you off. You'll sell your soul for a mess of pottage any second. Mm-hmm. You got to be faithful unto death, not just in life, but unto death. Do we have to think about our mortality to help us do that? Do we have to think about how death is coming? Oh, absolutely. But not only that, but you got to learn how to die daily so that when your physical death comes, you can use your physical death as a way of promoting a love and justice. Absolutely. Mm. Very much so. And learning how to die daily is to kill that fear, to kill that cowardliness, to kill that hatred, to kill that conformity, the structures of domination, and to kill the indifference inside of ourselves that allow structures of domination to go on. And that's the history of movements. We know Christians have no monopoly on this. My God, Christians have been some of the biggest gangsters in the history of the species. But uh, but it's true for every religion, every religion, you know, that the Buddhists and 
oh, Hindus, with the way they treat our Dalit brothers and sisters, you see. Judaism that is not prophetic, Judaism that has not been true to Amos and Esther can be accommodating to forms of domination and occupation as we have right now. Uh, you've got uh, Islam, my God, Islam, when it's not tied to prophetic Islam, the, 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 the kind of Islam you see in the Malcolm X, uh, uh, for example, can be uh, can be just as just as uh, accommodating to hatred and domination and so forth. But not just religion, secular traditions too, my brother. Yeah, can you explain? Because a lot secular of people think that too. secular traditions will let us escape. That if we just let go of these beliefs that are quote unquote wrong, that that is some innate move of liberation. But I don't. It seems to me they replicate the same pattern. Well, I mean, we know that, uh, uh, I mean, we can go back to pagan ones and just Stoics and the Epicureans and others, and there's some wonderful things about those traditions, and there's some ugly things about them. Stoics actually gave us conceptions of the universality of humanity that's very rich, that echoes that of prophetic Judaism and prophetic Christianity, prophetic Islam. Uh, uh, but, the, uh, um, but the secular moves usually are so tied to science uh, uh, that it, science itself can become an idol. See, there's a difference between scientific temper and scientific dogma. Yeah. Uh, scientific temper is so crucial, and we need that. The, the unleashing of human curiosity, the concern of evidence, the concern of conclusions being based on evidence and so forth. But we know in the name of science, they argued that women were less intelligent than men. In the name of science, white supremacy flowered and flourished. In the name of science, imperialism was promoted. In the name of science, capitalism was affirmed. So science itself is not monolithic. You have to have scientific tempers that are critical of the dogmas in science. And so when we talk about secularism, secularism is not a monolithic thing. There's some wonderful things about it in terms of being open-minded and self-critical and recognizing that we're finite and recognizing that we ought to listen to other people who we disagree with, and there's some arrogance and condescension in the secular culture vis-a-vis non-secular folk that reinforce the worst of human beings. Look at look at liberalism, which is a magnificent move of both secular and religious folk. But liberalism at its worst was what? Deeply imperialistic. Mm-hmm. Secular liberals still around in a very deep way. Secular neoliberals very much hegemonic among the professional classes, in the universities. What kind of dogmas are at work in the university? Do we have any critiques of empire coming out of Harvard, Yale, Princeton, University of Chicago, Berkeley, Morehouse, Howard University? Can students really go to go to those institutions and understand the ways in which America was an empire from the very beginning? No. no I mean, you got some 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 wonderful voices. I was just looking at Brother uh, Himmelwerp's uh, work on how to hide an empire. It's a wonderful book. Uh, uh, but he cuts against the grain. There's few, but not too many. Not too many at all. Because those institutions of higher learning and in- empires don't want to tell the truth about the empire that they inhabit. Hmm. And that's just one. That's just one example. You know, we've we've got ecological crisis. We, catastrophe coming. We got nuclear catastrophe coming. The wealth inequality, economic catastrophe, unbelievable loneliness, isolation, uh, uh, alienation of persons who have tremendous time even must, uh, mastering any forms of intimacy, which is a precondition of love. Vulnerability, which is a precondition of love. So what happens in a more and more loveless society? What happens in a society that's obsessed with pleasure, but has tremendous difficulty gaining access to joy? Mm. I mean, these are deep spiritual issues that go hand in hand with the decadence of a late capitalist civilization. And our poets have been talking about this for a long, long time, my brother. Uh, The musicians have been talking about this for a long, long time. That's why the artists and especially musicians are the vanguard of the species. That's why we live in a moment where we must look very much to our courageous visionary artists. Now we've got a whole wave of artists who are just mediocre, who are bad artists, who just sell their souls too. But I'm talking about the deep genuine 
artists. And that's been the history of black people. You see, black people, we could never have made it without our, our, without our artists, and especially our musicians. They have preserved black dignity and sanity. Who are you without listening black musicians, to? Black, black people would have been gone a long time ago. I'm listening to Dorothy Love Coates and the gospel tradition and Curtis Mayfield, who comes out of gospel, but very much is a uh, rhythm and blues brother. I listen to, uh, 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 oh, there's a brother that got a serious single. His name is Jay. What, what, you know who I'm talking about? James. Jay Carmonica. Jay Hart. Oh, God, I can't remember his Jay name. Electronica? No. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Ooh. Listen to him. All right. Oh, yeah, but he got something going on. And he has Jay-Z. Jay-Z's a genius, but I'm critical of a lot of Jay-Z politics. But Jay-Z's art informs me in a very profound and wonderful way. But the uh, but when it comes to hip-hop... What about uh, Chronics? Geez. You listen to any Chronics? Theory X and Tef Poe. Uh, no, I haven't got too much to Chronic. I got to, I got to, I got to catch the, up, though. Bro. Reggae, Reggae. I'm a, I'm a reggae. Oh, the reggae. He's yeah, reggae. Oh, no, 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 I got Everybody okay. knows. No, I love it. <laughs> I love it. Coming out of the legacy of Bob Marley and Marcus Garvey and company. Yes, and through, uh, uh, and through Garnet Adam. Silk. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, Lord. See, you teaching me, man. You I love that me. stuff. Well, that's, 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 that's an obsession so. of mine. But let me ask you this, though, yeah, that what I'm saying, does it make sense to you? Because I, I, I do respect your mind and your judgment. Does it make sense to you what I'm trying to say tonight? It makes a lot of sense to me. And what I don't, and, and I mean, you've influenced me. <laughs> and, I, and I've also, mm. I also remember mm. you when you've talked about the cult of smartness. And let's oh, try to man. be wise and let our phones be smart. What I wonder yeah. about... And, and what I am really curious about, and I talk with a, a really, really good friend of mine who people know from the show, Joshua Kahn, uh, Russell, I'll bring him into the conversation, is, is what is the bridge um, in terms of like, I, I'm, I'm reading Peter Schlotterdijk's book called You Must Change Your Life Right Now. And he's, his mm. politics are very different than our politics. But I love this idea that he's reworking religion as just an idea of practices that it's about mm -hmm. your own Olympian journey. And what I'm wondering is, is cause it seems to me that the left is, is, and this is one of the reasons I do, I will say I love and admire Lula so much is that there's so much heart there. And so Don't I'm trying to that, connect, that rich That's true. How, how do we, um, a politics that comes from so much empathy, but also doesn't necessarily generate the power in the Machiavellian sense to take on power or have the kind of like spiritual nourishment for a less of a, you know, for, you know, I, sometimes when I talk about this stuff, people look at me with a side eye, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, no, there is yeah, a yeah. spiritual dimension to this. What does that mean? Do people have to meditate? Do people have to listen to, to great music? I don't know. What is the bridge to engage it? Because I know that there's a whole emotional landscape that you speak to where we, if we don't access that, we cannot get to our destination. And I want to know what that bridge is. So it does make sense to me, but I want to know how it's actually created in, 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 in people's actions and practices every day. Well, I mean, it's got to go back to, uh, you know, the formation of the children in terms of the, uh, the socialization of young people through civic institutions from family, mosques, synagogues, churches, schools, temples, uh, sports connections, um, music connections, all of those things. When they get weak, then there's no doubt it's going to be difficult. You can call it soul craft. The institutional mechanisms of soul craft. How are the souls of people shaped? How are their personalities shaped? How are their characters shaped? What kind of values and virtues and visions do they have access to? Now, again, you know, the history of black folk is something that I think is quite instructive. Anytime the whole nation has the blues, that means we can, that nation can learn a whole lot from the blues people in, in its midst. And the history of black people is one in which it looks as if we have no way out. I mean, that's what Henry Howland Garnett said in 1836. Black folk never confuse your situation with that of the Israelites of the Hebrew scripture. For us, Pharaoh is on both sides of the bloody red seats. What you going to do when you live in a life in which Pharaoh is on both sides of the bloody red seat? 
But that's probably what Afro pessimism is about. That's what our dear brother Frank Wallace and, the, and others are talking about, right? Black right. folks' lives just cows waiting to be slaughtered. Well, there's a sense in which that's true, but that's not the last word. And I think Brother Frank would agree with that, even though uh, uh, his uh, Paul Taylor's review of uh, his recent book in the Washington Post is a fascinating start for a conversation. But what have black people done? Well, we had to create on the margins structures of feeling, structures of value that were in America, but not of America. Hmm. And politically, when it came to the contestation for power, the best of the black tradition has recognized that both parties has never spoken in any serious way to our plight and to our predicament. So that either we had to hit the streets, we had to go to jail, that most of our leaders who told the truth knew they were going to be assassinated, literally, or their character assassinated. They knew that those leaders would be crucified, lied on, misunderstood, but People still were not fearful. They were not fearful. Brother Martin used to say, I'd rather be dead than afraid. Mm -hmm. Marcus Garvey always had a folk at the be very beginning of every rally. The Negro is not afraid, has no fear. And all of us have fear, but courage is a working through fear. So do you have to have courageous folk who are willing to cut against that grain? And the music and the literature and the painting provide some alternative vision of the reality you're in. The great August Wilson, you know, the great playwright with his 10 mm -hmm. cycle plays of fences and so forth. He used to say every time a artist, especially a black artist, produces, they're authorizing an alternative reality. And you can't sustain a left movement without authorizing an alternative reality that is not just contra what's in place, but actually is a positive, constructive vision analysis, and most importantly, courage of willing to live and die. That's what I love about Adolf Reed. That brother is going to die anti-capitalist. It's just a fact. <laughs> it's just a fact. He's consistent. <laughs> oh, He's got very, what very Dan consistent. Austin called constancy. Now, I don't agree with everything Adolf puts forth, I don't know. I, I've taught him in my class for years. He and I fight like dogs 30 years ago. But he's always been my brother. And, and he is a intellectual who's committed to getting us to see with different analysis, getting us to discern with different lens through which to view the world. And that's what serious folk do. And of course, you know, great, that's what, precisely what great Great poets do. Shelley says poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. That's the last line in In Defense of Poetry, that posthumous text that he published after he, his, after he died in his young life. He's absolutely right. He said, how do we see differently? And it's hard to see differently if you're just locked into corporate media. That's why we love Sister Amy Goodman. So that's why we love Michael Brooks show. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's why we love the Michael Moore show. That we, we have some alternative lens to look at the world. And no, none of us have a monopoly on truth. We all in this jazz orchestra together. We're raising our voices, trying to empower others, all with a partial view. None of us having the full truth. But together we come closer to reality with more love, commitment to justice, more courage, and then go down swinging before the worms get our bodies up. So it, if, as if I'm hearing you correctly, you, it almost seems to me like if you uh, take time to read something that doesn't necessarily, you, you can't quantify reading a novel. That's right. You can't oh, place right. a value on it. But when you step and you reclaim time to do that, you're actually in a very small way prototyping or enacting a very different reality. That's exactly right. Okay. That's exactly right. That's why the Socratic legacy of Athens is so important. And Socrates says, look, I'm going to examine myself and society critically, and I'm going to be faithful unto death. And that example itself will serve as a catalyst for other people to see themselves differently. It will provide a process to see themselves differently through self-criticism. And I would say the same thing about the prophetic legacy of Jerusalem. 
Christianity. That's precisely what what, what Esther and Amos and, and Jesus and Muhammad are about. I want you to see the world differently. I want you to be able to keep track of the suffering, keep track of the misery, and respond to it in such a way that it's tikkun alum. You can mm-hmm. change it. You can amend it. But then you have to have the scientific legacy of, of the Enlightenment, which is to say you're going to need some analytical tools. You have to understand what capitalism is all about. You're going to understand what these forms of imperialism are all about. You have to try to understand gender, not in terms of some abstract category, but ways in which male supremacy have been shot through pre-capitalist and capitalist and white supremacist practices. And the same is true in terms of transphobia, homophobia, and, and what have you. And, and, but in the end, it's going to be a way of life. And this is, this is something that is very difficult, I think, in our civilization. Most people have a lifestyle rather than a deep, serious way of life. So the lifestyle comes from the market, the titillization, the, the carrots, the status, the money that's dangled in front of us. And we're obsessed with success and we lose out on moral and spiritual greatness. But moral and spiritual greatness comes from a way of life. And that has to do with a calling, has to do with vocation. And, uh, and, and, and that's why you can just read anybody. I mean, good God of mine, it could be the highest level of a Shakespeare or a Beethoven or a uh, Mary Lou Williams or a John Coltrane, or it could be medium. You know, you could be listening to uh, some of the popular groups around who are wonderful, but they ain't Beethoven. You know, they're wonderful, but they're not very loose. Or Coltrane, that's all right. Everybody, everybody has to be at that high level. But they're coming from their souls. If they're coming from their souls. If they're just playing for money, then it's a different kind of thing. And you can feel it. Can you connect oh, yeah, to a to a Absolutely. book that you write very that you wrote early called the ethical dimensions of marxist thought where you actually said that marx and and I love I actually really love that marx gives us a materialistic angle like hey this isn't because you know people are are being grumpy or whatever there's actually economies in place and interests in place i love that but then at the same time of and course he's, he's right about and that he's 100% right the power. oh yeah it operates the power and structures and institutions absolutely and then there's an but ethical you know dimension of it yeah absolutely I mean, you know and i know i mean marx's last name was was, was mordecai he comes from six generations of rabbis. His father changed his name when his father converted to Protestants. So Karl Marx is a profoundly Jewish brother who grew up Protestant, Lutheran, in a Jew-hating Prussia, who then becomes atheist because he sees the ways in which churches accommodate themselves to vicious forms of oppression in his day and up in our day. But he has a deep commitment to oppressed people. So he's looking for scientific tools that will help provide illumination to get people to see what's really going on, to get beyond the commodity form and see commodities not just as things, but as relations, to see working people not just as employees, but in power relations in the workplace, asymmetric power relations in the workplace vis-a-vis capital. And why it is that capital doesn't want them to organize? Why it is that capital will crush them when they present any kind of threat to the profits of capital? Karl Marx has an ethical dimension, but it's not an abstract ethics. It's a deep concern tied to freedom. He gets it from Schiller's Letters on Aesthetic Education. He gets it from, from Hegel. He gets it from he himself was a poet. He wrote magnificent uh, volumes of poetry to Sister Jenny, who was his his wife, who was uh, uh, upper class, and he had to marry across class lines, and his, her family never wanted to come close to him and so forth. So he's got this romantic sense tied to vision, imagination, transformation. And he thought that the only way you do that is overcome the forms of alienation in capital society. And alienation for him was a power relation in which working people being exploited were unable to be able to see enough and be unable to organize strong enough to have their dignity affirmed and to live lives that flower and flourish. 
So Marx is one of the greatest prophets of, 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 of the last 250 years. There's no, there's no doubt about that. I mean, Marx had his own, you know, limitations in terms of he was still European. And so he, he didn't have fundamental understandings of white supremacy. He was still a man and didn't have deep understandings of male supremacy at all. And uh, he had he, he didn't see religion having the real possibilities for prophetic and progressive possibility. When he looked at religion, he just saw opiate of the people. See, so when he looked at religion, he didn't see Daniel Barab. He didn't see Dorothy Day. He didn't see Martin Luther King Jr. He didn't see Rabbi Hassel. What he saw was institutional forms of Christianity, Judaism, and so forth. And most of those institutional forms are accommodated to oppression. And he's right about that. But in the same way, science yeah, can right be, science, and I, I want to just also mention another big influence on me, The Mismeasure of Man by Stephen Jay Gould. Oh, brother Steve Yeh is my colleague here at Harvard. He's a wonderful yeah. brother. We miss it. We miss it. Right. Very, very much so. Very much so. I'm sorry to go on and on like no, this. No, I but love I appreciate it. You this is what we want. To, 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 <laughs> no, indeed, indeed. I yeah, appreciate this, this because... I mean, it's the kind of engagement that you have with the right wing brothers in your marvelous text that uh, that just recently appearing that you want to you want to take people on based on argument, evidence, ideology, their own myopia, their own cowardliness, their own caricatures, the strong men and women that they concoct in order to think they put forward strong arguments and then think that they're not accountable. That they're not answerable. You say, no, I'm going to be Socratic. Listen to these kind of arguments. And by the end of the text, it's clear who wins, brother. <laughs> you have won. <laughs> now, you have won. Now, granted, I mean, so many of those right-wing brothers are not the most you know, profound right-wing brothers around. And let's just be honest about that. They're no, not they're like not Edmund the most Burke. profound. So not, they're we're not, not Edmund talking Burke. about Edmund They're not Burke. Plato. I mean, there's been some <laughs> profound conservative uh, of folk out there who we uh, who we have to confront because uh, the world is full of a variety of different forms of uh, insight and wisdom that come from a number of different ideologies. We have to just be clear where we take a stand. But I do appreciate that service that you rendered because I think after your text, though, bro, uh, it's, it's going to be about over for, for almost all of them. <laughs> well, that's a great <laughs> honor. Let me just say, oh, yeah. let me just say, could you... Real, I want to. I hope that you will join us again. I will send you chronics, and could you leave us with? And I know that you want to be very clear that that Trump has got to go. And I think I just oh, want to let know the folks that have any ambiguity about that. At least here, you know, I want to be clear in representing what Doctor West is saying. But what do you? Could you leave us with one, one daily dying note? Something we could take with us in our own daily death. Oh, no, it would be a blue nose. And the blue nose was always tell the truth mm. at any cost. Bear witness to love with all the risk. And then intervene in a situation not of your making where you have to work with what you got. You see, that's what Bessie Smith did. And that's what Holland Wolf did. They always told the truth. They bore witness to the love inside of them. They always knew they had to work with what they got, no matter what kind of guitar they had, no matter what club they were, they gonna still be true to themselves. They're not going to pose and posture. I was just talking to my dear brother, Bootsy Collins. Love that brother. We, we, we worked on the album together, the front capital of the world. He got a new album coming out. He, he's a he, he's one of our great geniuses. I want to hear he, that. And, and the fundamental thing is, you can't fake the funk. We can't have phonies, people posing and posturing. They one thing and they not something else. That's what we love about blues folk. That's what we love about Malcolm and Fannie Lou and Mark. They said what they meant. They meant what they said. And that's what we have to have. And so even in this moment in which we have to have anti-fascist coalition, anti-fascist uh, practice and anti-fascist text, anti-fascist sensibilities and what have you, just don't lie to the people. Don't lie to yourself. And we're all notion. hypocrites, but we're not all gangsters. <laughs> well, as long as you got standards, that's exactly right. That's, now, see, 
I'm 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 even a little more grim than that as a revolutionary Christian because I know I got some gangster proclivities in me, brother. Oh Lord. I'm telling you, I was a gangster before I met Jesus, and now I'm a redeemed revolutionary Christian with gangster proclivities. But what that allows me to do is still, you know, recognize that I've got to be humble enough uh, uh, to try to learn from others and humble enough to try to understand people's situation. But I still come down strong in terms of the truth that I try to tell, in terms of the witness that I try to bear and the justice I try to seek. And in that sense, I want to be a blues man in the life of the mind. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the highest, highest compliments one can ever have. Somebody call you. Brother Michael Brooks, man, you like the blues, man. Ooh, <laughs> no. Am I that for real, even given my hypocritical proclivity? You sure are, Brother Brooks, then you're going to do your thing, man. Have your radio show, write your books, and keep fighting for poor people and oppressed people around the world and pay any cost. Yeah, that's the kind of Michael Brooks I am on the vanilla side of town. <laughs> the blues is not in any way tied to skin pigmentation, my brother. No, 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 no. Blues is, is, a, is a way of life open to everybody. And that's the American democracy we can redeem if we ever get our way out of this. That's the best of the American project, but it's the best right. of, I think, projects all around the world. Right. Definitely. Definitely. Right. Dr. West, but will I, you I return? I love you, brother. Love you. Respect you, man. And you stay strong now. Thank you so much. I hope you'll return and stay safe and be well. All right, though, man. Right, and be God care. bless all your loved ones in this moment, though. Right on, right on. You too. Take care. Uh -huh. All right, folks. We are going to take a brief break, and we will be right back with The Gem with David Griscom. We'll be right back. <laughs> guys i'm taking the rest of the evening off <laughs> uh anyways thanks for everybody uh for making that possible obviously and i think we will i think dr west was happy so I, think, I, think, yeah. Yeah. So I think we'll do more uh but now it's time for another incredibly important part of the show the gem yeah with david griscom please david oh. go for it yeah we'll just you know talking in that kind of international uh, tradition and um, orientation that we're trying to build. I wanted to talk about specifically what's been going on in Argentina over the past couple of weeks because it's a very important story for us in our in our global uh, project of fighting against this horrible system of exploitation. Um, so in Argentina, for people who don't know, um, there's a new president who was recently elected, um, President Fernandez, 
who took over after one of just a horrendous uh, kind of right-wing neoliberal uh, institution under uh, President McCree, who very much devastated all the social programs, you know, did the kind of classic neoliberal uh, policies, destroyed the welfare state, destroyed the healthcare system. And obviously at a time like this, uh, those things are desperately needed and they weren't standing on, on good footing to face this coronavirus uh, crisis. So the response um, in Argentina, though, under the new government, under uh, Fernandez's government, has been quite heroic, especially for uh, South America, which has been, you know, really taken over with this horrible uh, right wing wave. And, you know, the coronavirus has really it's just really starting to sprout up there and it's looking, uh, you know, very dangerous for a lot of folks. So anyways. Fernandez's response has been a massive stimulus. It's uh, around 2% of the GDP of Argentina, which is huge. It's much larger than pretty much any of the G20 countries. Um, he's ensuring that there are no cuts to essential services for folks. He's making sure that domestic workers, and this is actually a really great proposal, domestic workers are getting direct payments because um, those people are usually the first ones to be let go in situations like this. All in all, around 8 million people will receive sub subsidies in Argentina. And, you know, he's provided funding to business, much like many other countries have done. But there's been one a simple demand with it. You will not fire your employees. If the government comes in to help you out, you must retain um, your workers. Okay. Now, you know, I mean, it's just like a you know night and day kind of situation versus the United States. He also has asked Congress uh, to tax the super rich. And he told uh, the rich in Argentina, uh, boys, it's time for you to earn less. Um, <laughs> Such a good one. That's a good Latin American left. Like that's very Lula. That's very, that's very Hugo Chavez. It's like boys. <laughs> yeah. You know, no, I, and I, it, basically, I mean, you know, this is such a, um, a light story in a way because it's a good humane response to a crisis, right? This isn't some kind of, you know, a Soviet government, some kind of radical worker state. I mean, this is just kind of solid human politics in the middle right. of a crisis. And the second part of, of this of this story is hitting on one of the fundamental inequities of the time that we're living in. That is the system of capitalist exploitation. So while this is all going on, there's been a fight going on behind the scenes with the bondholders. Uh, so Argentina has a significant amount of debt. A significant amount of this debt, by the way, was picked up under Macri. Um, and, you know, they took in like really horrendous IMF bailouts before. And those come with all of these rules. OK, you need to cut spending, you know, cut social services, all those kind of neoliberal policies. But there's also the bondholders. Right. And these bondholders, just so you understand, a vast majority of them are American people, Amer super wealthy American organizations. These are uh, BlackRock, Fidelity, T, T. Rowe Price. Right. These are American institutions. You know, some of their headquarters I can, you know, are, are just down the road in, in New York City. And they are basically saying to the Argentinians who have come, the Argentinians have come forward and say, we cannot make these debt payments at a period of crisis. We need to give the money that we have to the people directly and to go into an emergency spending program uh, to support uh, Argentinian people. Well, the debt holders have come back and they have refused um, to accept these these cuts. So, you know, obviously these are negotiations and obviously Argentina wants to pay as, you know, as little as possible in this time. And obviously the bondholders want to extract as much as they can. But any kind of rational, humane system would recognize that you can't do the necessary stimulus spending to make sure that the entire country doesn't fall into a Great Depression and pay massive amounts of debts back, debts that were um, incurred under a previous administration. You know, so like the, the debt agreement that Argentina put forward was saying that they will continue to make the payments um, just at a smaller rate. They'll only pay a 0.5% uh, interest rates that will eventually raise up to the 5% interest rates, which are very high um, by global standards, by the way. Um, and the bondholders have all come together, coalesced together, and they said, no, we will not accept this. So there's a potential that Argentina, you know, could have another debt crisis where they default. And that comes with all these financial penalties. Argentina has had this happen in the past. And basically the blame is being put on uh, the Fernandez government for, you know, not coming to the table to look out for the poor bondholders while their country is, is struggling. And I, 
I wanted to hit this because obviously it's a very frustrating story. We'll see what happens. Uh, you know, it does. And they just that, have just know, to, just want to say they haven't even straight up defaulted. They're just saying, let's go at a lower rate while we deal with yes. a global pandemic and protect our people. Because if you want them to not default too, if you're a, like a rational actor, you they don't want them. want them burdened because you want them to have an economy five years because these are long bonds, right? These bonds pay out for years and years and years. That's why you invest in them because you're going to get payments back in the long term. If you want to get payments back from Argentina 10 years from now, you should want them to recover their economy right now in the short term. I mean, it's just the constant struggle um, that we see where capitalists, they cannot never look towards the future. It's always what's right in front of them. And what's what will happen, for example, is if they were to get their way, it would be like going back to the original you know, history of Argentina and Latin America um, to, to that rate, where they just turned the entire continent into an open pit mine to mine silver. And they didn't care about the damage that was being done to the people who live there and the environmental um, damage either. Right. This is the kind of mindset of financial capital, right? Extraction, 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 ignoring all kind of political and human circumstances. And I, I was thinking about this when, uh, you know, you were talking to Cornell West, um, too. I think it's very important that we make this point, too. It's not just a question. Look, it's evil. What they're doing is absolutely evil, right? right. But they're not doing waking up in the morning saying, you know, today I'm just going to do some evil stuff to some Argentinians. They're saying, I want to make as much money as possible in the shortest amount of time. Right. And I'm going to leverage as much as I can. And in the system that we live in, the people who have money and the people who are trying to extract from the rest of the world have tremendous amounts of power. So for countries like Argentina and also, for example, what's going to be happening in Africa over the next few years um, with with this kind of the debt crisis that's bubbling up there as well. They have a lot of power to enact capital strikes. These countries need funding from the from the West, from the global north. They can make them pay outrageous interest rates. They have a lot of leverage and power um, over these systems. And that's something too that we need to be watching out for as organizations like the IMF and these international organizations start giving loan, um, you know, forgiving some debt, offering loans at very low interest rates. We need to make sure as, as an international community, as left wingers, um, that those for Forgive, that forgiveness that's coming from the international community isn't just going to pay back the bondholders because right. that's very likely what will happen. Right. Uh, we need to have everybody at, at the table. But, you know, what these people basically want to do with the bondholders' interest is, is they have this class unity. They understand that they can leverage um, this kind of extraction. Domestically in Argentina, what would that mean? That would mean further cuts of social safety nets so that more people, uh, capitalists can come in and privatize as much as possible. And for capitalists, providing service to people is a secondary aspect, right? What matters more is um, extracting as much profit as possible. That's the worst kind of model to have during a pandemic. It's the worst kind of model to have during a, you know, a global health crisis. Right. Um, so, you know, this endless search for profit, it's, it's the grease of the wheels of some of the most destructive and, and inhumane system that we've seen um, in, in, in human history. But until we tame that motivation, until we create systems that don't run on the profit motive, we are going to continue to see these crises come up over and over and over, despite our very human um, feelings of wanting to help our neighbor, help our communities, the kind of democratic feeling um, that that Fernandez is representing here is being will be, you know, is facing this uh, this economic logic that is completely out of touch with the reality and the human society that we want to live in. Yeah, that's perfect. And I, I want to just also note that uh, when you go back to the beginning of the pink tide, and we've covered the pink tide a fair amount on this show, and we'll only do so more. I mean, pretty soon we're going to have to do some pretty significant coverage on these new convictions, thankfully in absentia, at least, of President Correa, the former president of Ecuador, which in some ways follow a similar script to the, the charges against Lula. And Christina de Kirchner, who is Alberto Fernandez's vice president, mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's very important to note that she and her husband came into power in a genuine political partnership. Nestor is no longer alive uh, and really did reverse Argentina's dependence on World Bank and IMF mm -hmm. back in the Bush era. And they really did try to reorient the economy uh, in some pretty important ways. And th they would probably be, you know, as the sort of left Peronists, not probably the most rightward part of the entire pink tide. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, I would just say that, you know, uh, Christina Kirshner, like plenty of these other leaders, have just been relentlessly demagogued and smeared in the Western press. Yeah. And it doesn't mean, I think this is, you know, there's a countervailing tendency where, you know, if somebody's opposed to U.S. interests, we have to sanitize them. We can't have an intellectually rigorous conversation. I think that doesn't work because I actually mainly even just frankly for if you wanted to look at it in terms of propaganda purposes, I don't think that kind of bullshitting about everything works. Mm -hmm. um, and I would actually make a really hard and fast distinction, frankly, between um, the enormous complexity of something like China, which we just need to learn how to be adults about, um, mm -hmm. which is going to push back against uh, the new Cold War, fear mongering, war mongering attempt. Also combine the fact that that push against China is delusional. I mean, how are you going to, how much are you really going to bully a rising power where your entire supply chain relies on them? Mm -hmm. uh, and that it is very important to understand how China looks at the world, how they conduct their foreign policy. And then at the same time, I think it's ridiculous and foolhardy to make excuses um, of where China, you know, abuses rights or whatever else. I just, again, I just think it's silly. And also you have to look at the entirety of Asia. In the Middle East, um, you know, there's big variants here in terms of Iran, Syria, wherever else. But, uh, and again, abuses committed by these various governments and leaders like Assad, but the main story is pushing away U.S. interventionism, U.S. imperialism, which is extraordinarily aggressive in the Middle East, obviously. And I would say particularly in Latin America, uh, the distinction I would make is that um, these governments are not perfect. No government is perfect, but these are still states that are struggling on the periphery to do various forms of social democracy or in Cuba's case, more full communism. And that has to be a innately, uh, that, that has to be something we're really aligned with. You know, again, I think we could be politically and ideologically intellectually coherent. Um, and again, China is very hard to figure out. Obviously, we'll do more coverage on China. I think in the Middle East, I think Iran is fascinating. I have a lot of, I've certainly offended plenty of people with some of my defenses with Iran, but Iran is not a left project. Uh, it's delusional. Assad is not a left project. In Latin America, these are left projects. Um, and we really need to make that distinction if we're looking from the perspective of any government in the periphery, subject to U.S. imperialism, trying to work out delivery. And that goes for Argentina. It goes for Cuba. It goes for Venezuela. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just add specifically to, to the Latin America uh, dimension too is uh, look. It's like it's not necessarily saying, for example, that you know Fernandez. I, you know, I said that during the gem too. That you know, this is not necessarily some kind of like super radical, uh, you know, socialist project. But what right. this is very simply um, is a, is a nation, is a group of people who are being exploited on the international scale, fighting back against that system, and not having the ability democratically to make those kind of fundamental decisions. Uh, that, that you should be able to make in a democracy, right? If you want to say that we live in a democracy and we want to put the people first, we want to make sure that those are the people getting the funds first, um, you should be able to do that. But in, uh, it's really important when you start to take this zoom out and you start to look at the trajectory of history, especially over, um, you know, at the end of the, the post-Cold uh, War era, is that global finance and international capitalism really have veto power over democracy and loss of right. war. And specifically, too, in Latin America, I just, in the same way that there are so many deaths um, just due to colonization and, and the wickedness, I think it's really important that people understand how severe uh, colonization and the extraction of the continent of Latin America was. Um, you know, there's a really great book, uh, Open Veins of Latin America, that you should definitely check out. It really opened my, my eyes up, not only just how brutal the colonization was, but actually how integral it was to European capitalism. Right. The European capitalism that became the most dominant mode of production in the world could not have existed if it wasn't for the exploitation of the natural resources and the indigenous people in the Americas. The same with uh, you know, African people in Africa and with extraction in Asia. I mean, but these things are very much tied to the success, success of the capitalist project in Europe and then 
in the United States. And when we're right. talking, well, when we're analyzing what's going on today, it's very important that we can thread those things because those wounds are so deep and it's not just psychological. It's just that these, it's not just psychological. These are still material relationships that continue today. And this exploitation still continues in a very material way. Absolutely. And, and the reason that they would have to crush and, re and reverse the pink tide generally is that all of these leaders across the ideological from kind of center left to soft nationalist populist to much more socialistic from, you know, Ortega to Lula, they want independence. Mm -hmm. And that is fundamentally unacceptable to U.S. foreign policy and to U.S. corporate interests. And also one of the reasons why Venezuela was targeted so aggressively from the beginning is that Chavez, with things like the CARICOM initiative, which implicate the 2010 coup in Haiti and have implication for the movement uh, that was taking place you know, a year ago and ongoing in Haiti uh, in terms of basically you know, Venezuelan next to nothing interest loans uh, that were there to provide uh, poverty relief and development getting you know misdirected by certain members of the government that what Chavez did and what Venezuela is even still doing today when they get test kits to their neighbors in the Caribbean was say not only are we going to use our oil revenues like you know people don't know Venezuela actually already had state oil companies well before Chavez so it wasn't even just a question of nationalization. It was a question of using it geostrategically to try to create democratic and development alternatives in the Caribbean and Latin America. And that is, uh, and that is you know, the geostrategic reason of the U.S. pressure against those states. And it's also another reason, by the way, and people don't like this, but I mean, you know, the, to the extent China and Russia are present in Latin America, it's extremely beneficial mm. to counteracting U.S. hegemony and pressure. There's states in Asia, like, I, you know, I don't, look, should we have a war over Taiwan? Of course not. But I'm quite sympathetic to the Taiwanese position <laughs> in terms of their present reality. Uh, and, you know, and that's where some of these complexities come in. Yeah. Uh, guys, we're going to take a break. We're going to go to the post game. If you're watching this and you have the ability, go become a patron at patreon.com slash TMBS. An enormous amount of content. And if you're watching this on YouTube and you're a patron, let everybody know how great it is to be one. We have a jam-packed post game. Of course, we have Ben Burgess. Of course, we have Joshua Khan Russell. We also have um, an organizer uh, from Harvard who's basically talking about how to actually hold their university accountable. Piper Winkler is going to be joining us at the top half of the post game. Um, obviously, you know, we arrived at another destination with tonight's show. We keep going. We'll keep developing. We appreciate everybody who helps make this possible. Upcoming guests in the coming weeks, uh, Judah Freeland's coming on. That's going to be fun. Uh, Torre Reed is coming on. Uh, and a uh, bunch of other amazing guests. Tuesday streams, Brian Mayer and Stephen Cook. And Tuesday, it's re uh, excuse me, Sunday, it's rescheduled. Mark Blythe, 2 o'clock on the global bailout we need. If you haven't yet, hit subscribe and all the rest of it. But most importantly, if you can, go to patreon.com slash TMBS. Thanks a million, guys. We'll see you all in the post game.